right. So who am I? My name is Chris Huntingford. I'm the Global Power Apps Lead at Avenard. And basically what I get to do is build really cool stuff. Um, I look like I've just been run through the ringer because I had probably the worst cluster headache I've ever had in my life earlier today. So please excuse me. But yeah, I'm pretty amped to be here. So thank you, Yoshi and team. Now, I believe I've got roughly 45 minutes. I don't think I've ever done anything in 45 minutes. So uh, yeah, get your minds out of the gutter. Anything could happen. So if you want to follow me, do that. Yak, yak, yak. Um, you can go ahead and find me pretty much on LinkedIn or Twitter or use a carrier pigeon or something. Um, but yeah, I am, a, I am a Power Apps maker. And if you're wondering, if you have me on video and wondering what that says behind me, I promise it says maker. I got incredibly excited one day and built something out of Lego. But um, it's quite interesting. So I'll start off the presentation by telling you that Lego also call their builders or people that create things makers. And we call them the same in the Power Platform, right? And I will tell you just what that is very shortly. Anyway, back onto this glorious presentation that we've got going here. Right, so there's a couple of things that I wanna to talk to you about. And actually it's quite interesting because when I was at Microsoft, so I've only been at Avanade for about two months. I was at Microsoft for two years where I met Yoshi and team. And um, yeah, one of the things I learned pretty quickly was that, you know, I, I come from a business applications world and I will explain to you what that is as well. My glorious Azure friends. And um, one thing I learned pretty quickly was that the demand for mobile app dev has grown hugely. It's grown substantially, right? Which is pretty cool for us because, you know, the more it grows, uh, the more opportunity there is for people like you and I to go and help customers and create cool things, okay? So it's grown unbelievably fast. And actually, IT departments really struggle to deliver and keep up with their capacity. The next thing that I discovered, pretty awesome. And by the way, you know the scenario of 16.5% uh, of stats are made up on the spots? Well, uh, this is not the case. We have some backing from Gartner, Forrester, and pretty much every other magazine or website you can think of, right? So in the next five years, this is such an Adela, right? So he's the big shot from Microsoft. In the next five years, 500 million new logical applications will be created. So judging by the fact that there are now 143 people on this call, uh, if we spent the next five years every day building solutions and apps, we probably wouldn't hit that number, which is kind of cool. By the way, uh, I'm just telling you, I look like a ghost because the light on my screens is so badass and it hasn't gone dim mode. So yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna change that. You're just gonna have to be put up with me being all like bright and weird, okay. And the last thing that I want to tell you is that uh, another random stat, but this is true, by 2024, low-code app dev will be responsible for 65% of the application development market. Oh, my dear friends, those of you that are Xamarin com uh, coders and .NET coders and people that write and react, that doesn't mean your jobs are being replaced. So stop panicking, right? Doesn't mean Jeff from accounts is going to be able to write an app like you all do. Believe me, so there's no need to panic. But it is important that you know that application, um, low-code application or no-code app dev is really, really starting to emerge as one of the leading trends in the market. So with that being said, right, I'm going to tell you something pretty interesting. Have you ever heard of the concept of instant gratification? Right. So I don't know how many of you uh, have customers or how many of you are working for customers that kind of work within the IT departments and either you are a consumer of IT and you're, you're like, oh, I wish I had a thing to solve that problem now. And, um, and your IT department, you're saying the exact same thing, right? I feel like we've become quite childlike in our respect for uh, software and solutions. And I think software as a service has kind of spoiled us in that aspect. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that... Uh, I'm hoping that this is going to make sense. So my earlier today, my, my daughter came up to me and she demanded sweets. And uh, I was like, oh, leave me alone. And she's like, I want it now. And I said to her, her name is Lexi. I said, Lexi, if you could choose between a bright red fairy princess castle or a bright pink fairy princess castle and a tiny little chocolate, what would you choose? And uh, she wanted the chocolate because that's instant gratification. She didn't understand the concept of like later on, things will, things will matter, right? And um, it's pretty key. So organizations actually work a little bit like that today. And I'm sorry if I've insulted anyone, but it is what it is. Um, IT application dev is gravitating towards low code, no code because of the concept of high productivity. We can spit out solutions within minutes. And I'm going to show you one of those live tonight. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean you're petulant. What it means is that you need stuff done now because of the rapid pace of business. Things are moving so quickly 
and it needs to happen immediately, right? So I've kind of I've kind of discovered that, and there's nothing wrong with that. It just means we need stuff that works quickly. The next thing, which is pretty key, is that we also know, and this is when I was at Microsoft, that most of your organizations have already got the data. Now, data to me is is digital gold, right? It is absolute digital gold. So, oh, by the way, Yoshi, can I just check something with you? I want to. I just want to before I carry on, I just want to drag a screen across. Can you confirm that you can see my browser screen over the slides? Uh, I can't currently. Oh, no, I can. No, I can. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, great, great. So you can see the slide in the browser screen as well. Cool. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. So a couple of other things. So because organizations have got all this data, what I noticed is that many moons ago, right, before I moved to Avanade, before I moved to Microsoft, um, I actually used to write code, believe it or not. I used to work for Borland, um, writing Delphi 5. And if you want to reminisce, we can talk about bubble sorts and all sorts of things like that. But um, it was pretty interesting because I remember going to these conferences in South Africa and that's where the accent's from. And if you're from the UK, I'm not sorry about the rugby. Um, going to these conferences, whenever I, whenever I heard somebody speak standing in a lovely dress or a nice suit and they would say, you need to get data now and blah, blah, blah. So we all did. We all collected all this data, but nobody told you what on earth to do with it. <laughs> so we've discovered that most organizations actually have got hordes of this digital gold but aren't really doing much with it, right? Which is kind of sad. Now, this is another one of these things that, you know, somebody whips up a slide like this and you're going, oh, cool. They're going to make a point about each one of these things. So I'm going to start from left and work all my way to the bottom right or, or not. Okay. So another thing that happened to me when I got to the UK is I walked into a housing association and um, I'm not kidding you. This is an actual thing that happened and I'm not going to tell you who it was but they were taking calls in the contact center and sticking brightly colored post-its on each other's screens. It's like, what are you doing? Like, okay, I get it, right? You know, everyone likes a post-it, but like, why, why are you running around the contact center sticking post-its on each other's screens? Like, that makes no sense. And they said, well, the reason we're doing that is because every single time that we take a phone call and we send an email to our colleague, nobody picks up the call. So it's like, okay, well, why the post-its? Well, people will more likely to respond to the post-it. And actually, one of the biggest problems we're seeing in organizations is because of budget constraints and time and resource constraints, and because of the fact that people are just so used to managing these paper processes due to business expectations, they will go the route of doing something manual, right? Now, you know, folks on the call, I know, I know that you're all from like dev backgrounds and you're all AI ninjas and you can control, you know, you control um, artificial intelligence with your minds and do cloud bursts like that movie Men that stare at goats. But here's the thing, right? A paper process is a paper process. And the quicker and the more efficiently we can replace it, the better. And every organization thinks that their process is more complex than everyone else's, right? So the whole idea is that we need to be able to leverage technology to solve problems fast. Now, the Power Platform, Microsoft's Power Platform, helps you do that really quickly. The other key thing that I've noticed is that when you go to an organization and uh, it's quite fun because I chat to IT and IT are like, oh man, you know what? What we really struggle to do is make sure that we can control shadow IT. Now, we probably all know what shadow IT is. It's not when ninjas hide in the, in the shadows and fight people and then give them computers. It's really when users download stuff that they probably shouldn't to fulfill their jobs. So the example would be is that when you have this business problem and you need to solve it and you go into the dark web, and you download Zoho CRM. And then once you've done that, pow! IT all over you because your analytics and your measurements and reporting isn't correct, right? So what's the problem? That's shadow IT, folks. That's a thing that you cannot always control in an organization. And again, Power Platform helps you solve that problem. The whole idea is about generating a link between business and IT. So the Power Platform is effectively Tinder for business and IT. We bring them together in a sweet, loving relationship through technology, process, and people. Okay, so that all being said, right, we've got this whole idea that, you know, there are a lot of digital transformation scenarios that the Power Platform can help you solve. And there's a lot of really great things in the hood, right? Let's take a look at something else. Now, I'm probably going to offend all the pro coders here, which is likely all of you, but let's just do that anyway, right? So say, for example, I'm a business. My name is Chris, the business, and I've got a bunch of people working for me. And I'm really excited about all these people working for me. And I've got a problem I need to solve, right? So what do I do? I go to the Tesco's version of whatever that sells SaaS solutions, and I go and buy a SaaS product off the shelf. Cool, right? So because we're all spoiled, because SaaS is really easy 
NFT, right? You don't need to do much to it. So you go and buy this product and off you go into your organization, you go and install it and you use it. That's pretty kick-ass, right? And that solves a number of use cases. But then there are those outlying use cases that require custom developments and um, not all of them are really easy. So when you think about it, you might go and get, I don't know, Jessica. And Jessica comes in and she writes you a really kick-ass solution using some code. But then all of a sudden, very much like Captain Marvel, Jessica needs to go to another planet and fight crime. Well, folks, if your organization isn't set up to manage that information correctly, you are then set up with technical debt. How do you manage all that custom developments? How do you manage those processes? So what the Power Platform does is we don't say get rid of all that technical debt. We don't say replace your SaaS solutions. The way we see it is that everything else is an opportunity. Things like access databases, spreadsheets, manual processes, shadow IT, paper processes. We will augment what you've got and fill the digital gaps with a platform that we know works really well. And don't worry, I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm doing that thing like the Wesley Snipes movies where he leaves you hanging for a long time, right? So Microsoft have got this motto. Uh -oh. Chris just brought up another marketing slide. This is great, right? We haven't even built anything. Microsoft's mission globally is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Now, yes, I get that everyone's feeling very gushy and soppy and everyone's like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. But what does that actually mean? If you break that down and dig into it, Pretty sure some of you have seen um, have some of you have seen the most recent Avengers movie. Well, not so recent Avengers movie, which I'm very upset with my wife because she fell asleep in it. How on earth she did that, I don't know. But anyway, as our good friend Tony Stark leaves the bunker after going back in time, he says to his dad, "No amount of money ever bought you a second of time," which is absolutely true. And the only way you can empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more is to give them time back. Okay. So now that's pretty key. So would you prefer to be sitting behind an Excel spreadsheet capturing data, doing mundane stuff, or would you prefer to be engaging in a customer scenario or in talking to a customer and actually having a conversation that means something? I would rather automate, automate the, uh, the mundane process and actually have time with somebody that really matters. And the Power Platform actually helps you do that, right? So it gives you the ability to generate solutions rapidly and really provide that value back to the person that's leveraging them. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. So I'm gonna put down the marketing material for a second and tell you some, some interesting facts about our friends, Microsoft. I used to work there, it was a wonderful place to work. I don't work there anymore. Now, Microsoft is effectively divided into this concept of three service areas. You may in your existence have heard the term the three clouds, which is absolute twaddle. They are not three clouds. There is one cloud in Microsoft and it has a number of service areas underneath it. Those service areas being Azure, which is broken down to data and AI and apps and infra. You then have Microsoft 365 and you have a thing called business applications. I'm thinking most of the people on this call are absolute Azure ninjas, right? So feel free to yell out in the chat what you're good at. Um, but I myself am a, am a biz apps person. So I'm somebody that kicks ass at making ugly apps and really, really awesome processes, right? So I am a biz apps person. There we go. Ooh, did that actually work? Nope. Let me try it again. Cool. So really, really key, right? Because I love biz apps and I'm really good at that, I've had to learn other areas of the platform. And Azure, consists, Azure is effectively our foundation, right? So everything in the world is 100% or everything in Microsoft, well, most things are built on Azure. They're then I call it the Azure and M365 burger. They're kind of coupled in between those two things. And business applications is included in that. Biz apps kind of lives in the middle of that. Now, what's really awesome is that the Power Platform is basically technology from these service areas. It's surfaced up to you in a more palatable format. So what is the Power Platform? What is this thing that I've said about 16 times, right? And I've been hammering it into your heads. It's a really cool slide with some colorful pictures. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a bit more than that. So let me tell you a story, right? Um, many moons ago, Microsoft understood this concept of low-code developments, and it was really key for them to provide organizations with the ability to generate uh, value really quickly. And unfortunately, writing billions of lines of code didn't really do that. So what they did was they said, you know what we should do? We should create a platform that gives people the ability to snap digital bricks together to create solutions that they need 
based on certain patterns that we've seen. Now, most of you on this call likely have leveraged tools like Power BI, which is the most popular part of the Power Platform. Now, no, we don't put power in front of everything. We tried, it didn't always work. I'll tell you why. But Power BI is one of the core things. So Power BI is effectively our analyze layer. It's the thing that lets us analyze and understand data. We have this thing called Power Apps, and Power Apps is what you call our act element, and act allows you to act on data. So think about it as um, instead of analyzing data, you now come to an outcome, you can act on it, or so something's happening, you can do something. Like, you know, when you swipe left or right on Tinder, you're acting on data. When you're moving those little bubbles up and down on Candy Crush, you're acting on data. That's exactly what a Power App lets you do. Power Automate, I still think they should have, called, I still think that Power Automate, it, it was a primarily flow, and um, obviously, because Microsoft bought a number of other products, uh, including, you know, soft emotive with art robotic process automation, it couldn't just be called flow, excuse me, flow anymore, because, uh, yeah, it was much bigger than that. So Power Automate became the brand. And actually, I'm a bit naughty because I've got some old names on this slide. But flow is effectively cloud flows. And UI flows are effectively desktop flows. And then you've got business process flows, which are actually part of the Dynamics suite, which have been democratized into Power Automate. And then finally, Power Virtual Agents. To me, that's kind of the, the Tarantino version. I want it to be called Power Bots, like a transformer. That would have been way cooler. But that's our interaction layer, again, from a chat perspective. Um, a lot of people look at these four uh, interactive elements, and they always say that the odd one out is Power Virtual Agents. But I, I don't really think so. And I'll tell you why. Because Power Virtual Agents is effectively another mechanism to interact with data. So. There's this concept of the 1 billion in the world right now. And the 1 billion are effectively people with mismatched interactions with, their, with society. I'm part of the 1 billion because I suffer from cluster headaches and I also have a thing called keratoconus. So I don't always have the ability to peer into a screen and put stuff in, right? Now that's not saying you can't use tools like cognitive services, but Power Virtual Agents gives you the ability to interact with data in a way that is a bit more simple, right? So instead of having to capture data, you can actually go through a whole process without having to see a screen necessarily, right? And that's really important. Underneath that, we've got what we call our data layer, which is the most important layer. All of that stuff at the top means nothing without data. A Power BI report without data is junk, okay? A Power App without data, well, it becomes an instruction manual. Automation without data is not automation, my friends. And Virtual agent without data, well, that's like having a conversation with yourself. And I still maintain I am the best company I've ever had, right? But data is key, very key here, right? We've got this thing called data connectors. These allow you to connect to anything. So we've got about over 400 connectors now. So if somebody's an SA, if you're an SAP shop and you're on the call and you're missing some functionality in, uh, in SAP, we can connect that up into what we call our app layer, our interaction layer, and actually build that out for you. So if you're, say, for example, missing a credit check function in SAP, we can create that in an app and plug that in. If you're using Oracle or Salesforce.com, not a problem. Now, what's important here is that many moons ago, we would have walked into an organization that had Salesforce, try and sell them Dynamics and lose, right? Now we can augment. We're not about replacing. We're about working alongside. And if you would like to replace, not a problem. A couple of other things that are really key. AI Builder. Now, some of your cognitive services legends, I heard some of the winners of the hack, and I mean, God, you guys are awesome. It sounds amazing at what you did. But AI Builder is pretty, pretty cool, right? Because it's actually democratized artificial intelligence from the cognitive services layer, brought up into the Power Platform layer in a more palatable format. So as an example, the Forms Recognizer tool, right? Yes, that exists in Azure. We have an actual widget in the Power Platform, the pre-built digital brick that lets us actually interact with those forms directly and move that data into a data storage facility through the app layer. So you know what scares me? A citizen developer can do that. You don't need to be an IT pro. You don't need to have 4,580 years of experience, right? And uh, that's the part that I love because we can now empower users to do this stuff without actually really having to learn a whole load. Um, another key thing that's really important here is a tool called the Common Data Service. Now. You may say what you will, right? I know some of you are SQL people on the call, some of you are Cosmos people, some of you are SharePoint people, okay? SharePoint is not a relational database, stop using it as one. Under the scenes, it has SQL, but it is designed as a list element for you to store limited pieces of information in SharePoint lists. It is not a highly relational database. Like I said, don't use it as one. 
The common data service is effectively the data layer or the preferred data storage facility that lives underneath the Power Platform. And here's something fun. We just rebranded the common data service to Dataverse. Kind of like the Spider-Man movie, pretty cool, right? Enter the Dataverse. We're a cool comic book mask. But the common data service is effectively a data storage facility that contains both security, data storage, rules, and a load of other things that are brought in from Azure, right? So I want you to think about something. Those of you that are SQL fanatics and going, well, I would never use the common data service or Dataverse. Well, you're using it, you're using SQL if you use data, the data storage facility there anyway. So you know what? It's all built on top of Azure anyway. Uh, just cost a little bit more, that's it. But it's pretty important for you to know that we're not taking your toys away. We've just democratized functionality. Uh, and and that's, that brings me to the next thing. You know, when we talk about this whole concept of like pro development and all, and all that, one of the things that I'd like to show you, which I'm going to sneak onto the screen over here, there we are, is this concept of development capabilities, right? So let's just do that. Right, development capabilities. Oh, come on, slide, play ball. Right. So with the platform, instead of you only being able to use the digital bricks that Microsoft give you, you have another opportunity you can create your own. So my analogy is this, right? Think about scrounging through a box of Lego, a big box of Lego, and you're looking to make a fairy princess castle or a pirate ship. And you start bringing those pieces together and you're finding all these really amazing tools. And these pre-built digital bricks seem to be doing the job. However, you stumble across a piece that you need, like a four by two by eight piece. And as much as you look in that box of Lego, you will never find it. How on earth will you make your fairy princess castle or awesome pirate ship? So you know what? You can't make your own Lego brick. You have to improvise. In the Power Platform, you can build your own digital bricks. So if you find that a Power App, the Power Automate Tools, PVA, or Power BI doesn't cater for that, you can leverage the tools directly within Visual Studio or Azure and actually build out your own digital bricks. Now, we call them Power, Power Apps Components or the Power Apps Component Framework. And it's all code that you know. Things like TypeScript and Java, right? Really, really great functionality where you can actually bring this pro developer capability directly into your platform layer. Doesn't always mean that you have to code. It means that if you do write those digital bricks for your organization, they can reuse them over and over again, which is really cool. So folks that are pro developers, and this is something I hated when I worked at Borland. My worst thing was building user experience. Can I be honest? I still suck at it. What I'm really kick-ass at is making ugly apps that have great processing. If you're a pro developer and you don't want to do UX, that's fine. Let the people that do user experience do it well. Let the subject matter experts take that on. But you go ahead and you build those digital bricks and let everyone else use them. That's where I know you'll be good, right? So I'd wanted to bring that up and make sure that from a pro dev perspective, you understand that. And that's only growing with the platform. Last couple of things before I get onto the actual demonstration. When we talk about the Power Platform, excuse me, a lot of the time, we talk about this concept of apps, okay? So when you hear the word Power Platform, you hear the word apps and everyone's like, oh, it's an app and I'm gonna app this and I can't wait to build that app. Can I be honest, an app is just a byproduct of data, right? It's not, it's not the be all and end all of everything, right? And that's pretty important because an app is just a simple single thing. It's one thing. I talk about solutions. I talk about the ability to create multiple solutions, solutions of different capability. When I look at the types of solutions on this slide here, I agree. Chris, you shouldn't have bucketed them into only five little buckets. Yeah, whatever. You know, I mean, I, I could have done it multiple ways. I just chose five because that, that seemed like a logical number. But it's important for you to know that categories of solutions will differ depending on complexity, utilization, and many more things. But dates will be the primary thing that underpins it. In no world, and I hope you agree with me, in no world can have solution that's only used by three people in your organization costs the same as a solution that's mission critical that's used by thousands. If it is, something's wrong. So the Power Platform allows you to, the Power Platform gives you the tools to build out solutions of all size and shape. You can build out mission critical solutions that run your organization, or you can build out simple team productivity solutions that let you do basic things. So what I thought I would do is show you something pretty basic. Nothing complex. We're going to build a live app. Um, I'm going to run the demo gauntlet now. I did sacrifice something small, fluffy, and very unhappy this morning. So let's see what happens. But for this next section, uh, you're going to need to whip out them iPhones or whatever you're using, whatever the kids are using these days. And I put a link to 
this form in the chat. But the demo I'd like to show you is quite a simple one, right? Recently, I had a discussion with a utilities company. And um, what they did was they had the ability on their website to allow people to capture when they saw leaks in the road. Now, this is quite a common thing in um, councils. So as an example, you run around the council and you spot a leak in the road, you can pop onto your mobile device like a very good responsible citizen, your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, and you can go ahead and catch to that information and let them know that there's a leak by taking a photo or something. Now, this is a proof of concept and I have not gone that far, but I am going to give you the ability to give me some data. Now, what makes these demos even more funny is if you capture random stuff. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to demonstrate to you some integration using Power Automate Flow. I'm going to demonstrate to you some Power BI, some of the core components of the platform and give you a little bit of a taste about what it feels like to build an app as well as a solution. So feel free to capture that information, right? Um, like I said, if you haven't scanned the QR code, you will just need a smartphone. If you're using a Nokia 3310, simply use the link in the chat, right? So the process looks a little like this. Now, I'm not going to show you everything. I'm going to show you some of the pieces of the platform. What effectively you will be doing is capturing information into Microsoft Forms. It's a public-facing form. That information will then go through Power Automate and into, believe it or not, a SharePoint list and then into to Dataverse, so I've got two points of integration. I've just hit in the SharePoint list. I'll be using Power BI to report on that data, right? As well as Microsoft Teams to hold the actual information from a singular process perspective. I've also got a Canvas app in there to actually allow me to build out an app that my field technicians can use to go and check out those leaks. So very straightforward. All I'm doing is I'm rooting through my box of digital bricks and I'm snapping things together to make a really kick-ass solution, right? Like I said, the link to the form is in the chat, so you don't need the QR code. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my demonstration environment and show you what this looks like. So Yoshi already con uh, confirmed you could see the form. I'm hoping it's still there. If it's not, just shout and make a fat racket, right? So first things first, I'm going to put in my street address. Um, in fact, you know, we're going to go for 20, 20 Abbey Road, and that's going to be in Dublin. So Abbey, right? Um, also, please excuse my spelling. Uh, I'm not even going to try. There we go. So I'm, all I'm doing is I'm busy reporting my leak. I could be on my mobile device. And the surname was hunting forward. You know how many times I've misspelled my surname? I, I would swear. My email address is Chris. And this is real. So if you'd like to take it down and send me strange things, feel more than welcome. If you're a Zoom bomber on the call, this is the perfect time. <laughs> it is Dublin. And it's D01. Cool. So all I've done is I've used my form and I've captured some leak information. So I've reported a leak using Microsoft Forms, right? The next thing, well, that's all good and well. Um, where do all these results go? Now, I don't want to show you the results immediately. In fact, you know what? I will. So what I can do is I can go into my results over here and I can get a consolidated view of all the leaks that's been captured. There we go. So you guys are going nuts. That's absolutely fantastic. I'm going to go into my list of leaks. Sounds like a soup. The list of leaks, right? I'm going to go ahead and um, let's give this a little bit of a, a search. So ZA, see, I'm capturing a flat list over here. And um, yeah, some of you will recognize your information. I'm sorry, I'm showing this all live. There we go. So you've actually given me a ton of data. Thanks so much, right? But this, this is still kind of not really structured. I need some information that's like going to be ready structured so I can get a technician out there. And also, I'm going to build an app on top of all of this. What I've also done is I've managed to alert myself. So myself is alerting myself of all those leaks that have been captured over there as well. So thanks very much. It's actually telling me in my demo environments in Teams that all of your good people have captured some leaks. Right. What I've also done is um, I've done the classic, the classic thing with Power Automate. Everyone does this. And I've said, yep, I'm going to go ahead and send myself an email to let myself know that there's a leak. Right. So pretty straightforward. I built some automation. Hooray, kick ass. That's high five. However, the important part is I've actually taken that data and plug that into Dataverse. So using Power, using my form, Power Automate, I've actually populated Dataverse, a Dynamics 365 app with all of the information you guys have given me. Now think about this. I had the information in the SharePoint list, which is really easy. But through automation, if I open up this record here, I've been able to apply process and rules to that piece of information. And I can actually use the, the servicing functionality to go and schedule somebody to go and fix that leak. Now, as the wheel of doom carries on, 
One thing I'd like to tell you is Dynamics 365, I told you, business applications is a power app. It's made from the same digital bricks as the Power Platform provides. So this is what I call a model-driven app. It's a mid-office application that lets me manage my processes. Okay, so remember, you gave me info, I took it through Power Automate, put it in Dataverse, and I'm just showing you an app, right? I'm showing you a single app embedded in Teams. So when I scroll down, you can see I'm not speaking porky pies there. Daniel McLovin, love the surname. Watching too much Superbad, my friend. And you can see I've got a business process flow at the top I can actually use to go and schedule somebody to go out and fix this. What's also pretty cool in field services is you have got the ability to do what we call soft bookings and hard bookings. So based on, can I, can I do this in Liam Neeson voice, right? Based on a particular set of skills, I can go ahead and find somebody in my system that have the skills to fix a leak. Now that's intelligent, right? So you've given me flat data. I've run it through a list, checked it, and actually plugged it into Dynamics 365 in order for me to go and schedule that leak. So here's my list of people. And I can go ahead and pick, uh, let's pick. Let's pick Wilson. There we go. Wilson, you're going to be scheduled. Cool. Done deal. Right. But Wilson will get that on his mobile device and we can go to sleep happy as Larry, right? Very, very simple. Hope everyone's still with me. How did I get the data in there? Well, what I did was I built a Power Automate flow. So I'm showing you this blue thing over here, right? So I'm just showing you Power Automate flow. So I've gone into make.powerapps.com. The most Microsoft thing I ever heard was a thing called the Maker Experience. So I'm in the Maker Experience, and I'm going to open up my leak report flow. This actually tells me how many automations have run. So you all know this, right? I'm going to pop into that one and uh, make sure that everything ran smoothly. Super simple automation. I'm not applying any crazy rules. From a Microsoft form, get the details, create an item in SharePoint. Once it's been done there, pop an item into the Dataverse, post a Teams message, send an email. Not rocket science, right? This is the thing that allows me to apply the intelligence. Okay, SharePoint is not going to give you the ability to do this. This only works, this type of Power App only works on top of Dataverse. Okay, very good for mid-office line of business type solutioning, right? If you try and do this for two people, it might be a bit overkill. All good and well, right? So all I've done, again, I'm going to run you through it again, is I've said, opened up my, I've captured some detail in Microsoft Forms using Power Automate, populated Dataverse, from there, showing you a model-driven application with that data inside of it, right? So that's all we are. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about our analytics. Now, I do want to apologize for this. Um, my Power BI never looks good. Rishi is going to be cringing in fear. It's not because I have no talent. It's purely because I have no taste. Right. So how's my Power BI? I can tell you that I've got primarily a large amount of a uh, number of large leaks going on in Dublin over there. Uh, you can tell by city. There we are. Oh, I don't know what was going on in July 2019. Leak fest, maybe. I don't know. That sounds filthy, but yeah, we should carry on. Anyway, so I can go drill into Dublin and see what the hell's going on. And obviously by Abbey Street, there's a lot of leaks. Oh, look at that bad boy. Wow. Anyway, so you all know what Power BI is. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Showed you the yellow piece there on leak management report, right? The one thing I do want to show you is how to build a Canvas app out of this. Now, the Canvas apps are pretty cool because again, you can embed them in Teams. So what I can do is I can and have a Canvas app for my internal people. Canvas apps are not external apps. I repeat again, you are not going to find a Canvas app on the iOS or Android store. Okay, super important. B2B, not B2C. Okay, I could pop in. I can have a look at some of my embedded reporting and see like, oh, fantastic. Let's have a look. Give it a sec to load. Might take a moment or two. I can't remember why I added a button there. I was obviously testing something. There we go. It's a very basic but I do want to do those, go and actually get a list. So I can pop into my list as a field worker. I can see that there's a bunch of leaks going on there. Pop into, wow, look at that one. That's a major burst. Cool. Awesome, right? Go, and, go ahead and edit that. That's a very basic app. Now, that's all fine and well, right? That's a very basic Canvas app. Like I said, you can make that available via your mobile phone for your technicians to use. How did I build that app? Well, just remember, all I'm showing you is this bit over here, right? It's still a power app. So I'm going to go ahead into my list of leaks. I just can't get past the name. I think that needs to be a shirt, right? The list of leaks, SharePoint list. Okay, I can build my I can build my app on top of any data storage facility. My list of leaks is uh, I'm going to go ahead and build an app from there. So create an app. I'm going to call it list of leaks. I don't know why I can't stop saying that. It's the best. Okay. 
this is going to go ahead and build that app. Now, I'm betting you I can build an app in 30 seconds. Okay, so those of you that are on the tequilas or beers, this is a good time to smash one. While that's doing its thing, I do want to bring something up very quickly. And this is using artificial intelligence, by the way. It's all very smart. One thing I want to build up is that I've just told you that I can build an app on pretty much any data storage facility. And that's really true. If I go ahead and drag that, I'm going to leave that open for you. These are the types of data storage that I can use. Now, there's loads, there's hundreds, but the typical ones we see are Excel, SharePoint, Dataverse for Teams, Dataverse, and SQL. Now, you'll know a lot about that and that. Excel is not a database. Ask the NHS. They lost a lot of records. So I'm sorry if those of you are NHS on the call, but uh, in the news, we did see that. So um, yep, switch out to another more structured data storage facility. SharePoint slightly relational. You can do some stuff on it. Oh, by the way, the app's been built, so I can go and put that into production. SharePoint's, SharePoint's got some stuff that's slightly relational. Dataverse for Teams is way more relational than SharePoint, but limited by the type of people that can access it. We've got Dataverse, which is highly relational, highly secure, highly referential, right? It can be a little bit expensive. So sometimes if you're building out a data storage facility and Dataverse for two users, that's like, uh, that's like buying a Ferrari and driving it two meters down the road. And uh, finally, SQL. SQL is great for pretty much anything. I mean, that's like one of the go-tos and are highly technical as well. So I would definitely suggest, you know, these two for really productionized scenarios, these three for more sort of personal team productivity. Anywho, so there's my app. Fantastic. Um, all I'm doing is I'm showing you a Canvas app. I can go ahead and run this app. I can uh, add a new record over here. I'm going to call this Jeff the record, and we're going to say, Chris, uh, H, and we're going to uh, give some random email, and we're going to put 130 South, there we go, and city, blah, 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 code is going to be RG, cool, so I can go ahead and save that record directly from my app, if I go back into my list, and I search by title, once again, Z2A, uh, eventually, I should have called it something with a Z, but yeah, Jeff, Jeff, the record will be on that list. So there we go. There's Jeff, right? So Jeff is in my list already, directly from my Canvas app. So all I've done is I've gone capture information over there, put it in SharePoint, carry on with my day. Fine. Now, how do we make this look semi-okay? Like one thing I do want to tell you once again, very much like my Power BI, my apps don't look great. It's not because I have no talent. It is definitely because I primarily have no taste. So I'm going to go ahead and add another screen. Canvas apps look a little bit like PowerPoint and Excel had a love child, don't they? You got your formula bar over there with your screens and your properties available on the right-hand side. So we're going to call this splash screen. You can pick your naming convention. I'm definitely not opposed to anything. Let's give it a nice background image. Uh, we've got to downloads. Oh, we're in the downloads folder, folks. Anything could go wrong here. Here we are. Good, nice little background image over there. Uh, let's add in some sweet little icons. Come on, so we're just going to stick in one and we'll go ahead and change the color and copy this. This is very much like copying elements in the PowerPoint. Go home, change the color over there, whack. And uh, what we'll do is we'll make this, we'll give this the, the browse icon over there. You can simply copy paste pieces, uh, uh, elements on the app. So this one will make the, uh, let's call it the home icon. You can go ahead and search for different, different icons. And finally, this one over here, whoops. By the way, I designed this background and it's all called Canva, C-A-N-V-A. It's not Microsoft owned, but it is very cool. So if you go to canva.com, you can build some kick-ass GIFs and things. Um, totally up to you, uh, Paige. Whoops. How do you misspell the word doc? That is embarrassing. Anyway, so you can see I've got my very basic report. When I want to navigate to different pages, I simply select my icon, click action, select navigate, and I'll select the browse screen. Like PowerPoint, you can choose your transition. Yep, navigate. I'm just going to select my splash screen. Cool bananas, right? Haven't got a report screen. Let's make one. We're going to duplicate screens over there. I'm going to say report, report screen. Cool. Make sure that I navigate both pages. Coolness and last one. Let's make sure navigate and what we also need to do is on our browse screen, we need to have a little home button to take us all the way back home should things get dangerous. Oh, look at that theme. I'm not sure I like this theme. I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to change the app theme to something a little different. 
Uh, I do like red, but looks like the look and feel of the actual app isn't really red. So let's stick with the steel blue. Magical. What I can also do is I can go ahead and do exactly the same thing as I did before, select some background images. You can also change some of the look and feel of the app itself. Now, those of you that are writing apps and things like Xamarin and uh, you know React and all of that, this is really good for wireframing if you don't want to put this in a productionized scenario. And uh, let's go for, we're just going to make this background a lovely, there we are. Cool, that looks a little better, right? Getting getting there with the theme image. What's cool is that in each one of these scenarios, you can see the um, items bar with an expression at the top. This is what you call PowerFX. It's the new name for the other uh, formula code or the expression code that Microsoft have come out with. So yes, we do kind of put the word power in front of everything. Aren't you glad we didn't put the word power in front of flow? That would have been awkward for everyone. Anyway, so fantastic, I've got the base of my app. Last little thing I wanna do is chuck in, some, uh, chuck in some dashboards over here. So let's go charts, tile. This all integrates with Power BI. So remember that sexy report I showed you earlier, I can actually bring some of the, uh, some of the information directly into the app. What's kind of weird is you can also embed Power Apps inside Power BI. So if you've ever seen the movie Inception, uh, that's kind of what happens here, except uh, less destructive, which is kind of cool. All right, so let's change that over there. These are all calling directly from a um, from a dashboard. Cool, last little bit, control C V. Right. So my field technician or my field worker, whenever they use my app, can pop on and actually kind of get some information about what's going on in that specific area. Uh, there's a pie chart. I do have a saying, friends don't let friends build pie charts. So again, if Rishi's on the call, I'm sorry, pal. I didn't mean to build a pie chart. Please don't judge me too heavily. And let's go there. Cool, over time, done deal, all right? Awesome, app is ready to rock and roll. Let's run this bad boy. Uh, cool, let's go home. Ooh, home button doesn't work. We just gotta make sure all our functionality and navigation is set correctly. And, uh, ooh, you see, I did it backwards. Typical Chris error, right? So let's start again. But when I wake up in the morning, I'll open my app. I can go have a look at some of the reporting and see what's going on in my area. Magical, get a little bit of a view of uh, where all the issues are. Seems like most of them are happening in a certain area. You can see most of the, the leak types. You can drill into an extent with the maps. Um, go back home, let's fire off into our browse screen. I can go ahead and capture a new record and you've already seen, I've already run it for you. And ultimately that information will land up directly within my SharePoint list over here, as I showed you before. So to recap, my friends, all I've done right, is number one, you gave me some data. Thank you very much for that. I used Power Automate Flow to take that data and stick it inside of a SharePoint list and then finally move it into Dataverse, which has a model-driven app called Microsoft Dynamics built on top of it that allows me to manage that, that exact record through a process. What I also showed you was some Power BI with some sexy tiles that I used inside my Canvas app. And my Canvas app is available to my mobile workers for interaction and they can pretty much do whatever they would like with it, right? The cool thing is that when you're looking at Power Apps, can okay, I wanna bring up something really important here. When you're leveraging tools like Power Apps, no Power App ever magically gave you access to data. Okay, so I'm gonna say it again. No Power App ever gave it, magically gave you access to data. If I do not have the right security roles to get into the SharePoint list, I ain't gonna be building an app on top of it. If I have not got the right security roles to get inside my Dataverse back, uh, my Dataverse backend over here, I ain't going to be able to build apps on it. Well, I can try and build an app, it just won't do anything with the data, right? Which makes it again an instruction manual. So it's very important for you to know that in the background, right, the app respects the data storage facility. Sure, you might have a Power Apps license, but if you don't have a Salesforce license, you're going to be in some problems when you're trying to build a Salesforce app and connect to data. So very key for you to understand that, right? Power apps, especially Canvas apps, the thing that I showed you here, looks like PowerPoint and Excel had a love child. These are called Canvas apps. They're amazing for augmenting and filling digital gaps, right? So very key for you to know that. Finally, a couple of other things. In the background, right? We've got this tool called admin.powerplatform.com. And Power Platform, is one of the tools, admin.powerplatform.com is one of the tools that helps you govern and manage what is going on within your data storage facility. So important that you know this, anything that happens directly in here, 
you can actually view through the analytics layer. So I can tell you what apps are being used. I can tell you what automations are being used. And most importantly, I can tell you what connections are being used. So if you've got Jeff from accounts that thinks it's a good idea to post a tweet every single time he gets a sales lead, you can block that. And that's really important because you can block it through things like data loss prevention, okay? Now, a little bit of a hooligan, I don't have any data policies, don't tell anyone. But yeah, you can block it all through data loss prevention. Also through the admin interface, you have the ability to even do elements of data integration. Now my friends, this eight node data factory, okay? It's like, kind of like Power, Power Query on steroids, right? But it's not gonna do, may I use a Kelvin and Hobbes term? It's not gonna do data transmogrification, right? It means to magically change something. You've got to build the rules inside the data, the data transformation tools that you're using within Azure. This is a great way to move data, but it's not the best way. And I'm being brutally honest, right? So just so that you know, in the background, there are administration tools that help you manage all of this. So we are governed, compliant, and secure. My final word I wanna to leave to you when you start thinking about power apps and the power platform, right? Is that yes, what I built here, it took me only a few minutes and I built something pretty basic. You know, you, the app intelligence is all within the, uh, the expression layer. But I would like to say that it's very important that you know that when you are building out solutions, if you give people access to, um, as an example, I don't know, let's say you have a certain, you have a certain database, right? and you give people access to that data storage facility, you are then risking the fact that they're gonna build an app. Yes, you can remove the, the Power Apps um, licensing from that person through uh, various mechanisms, but it doesn't matter in your business if people are accessing that data through a Power App or through a, uh, I don't know, a chinchilla, whatever, a bat squirrel. They're still getting to the data. It's up to you to maintain the data storage facilities at rest, and not up to the Power Platform. We can warn you, but you need to maintain it. So that data is on you, that security is on you, right? The platform layer is the interaction layer above, unless you're using Dataverse or Common Data Service as was previously known, then it's a lot more integrated, okay? So very important for you to understand that. The other thing I'd like to say is when you're looking at um, data storage facilities, now I've only given you an example of a couple and there's a question in the chat that says, what's your view on graph databases? I don't know super loads about graph databases, but um. If there's a mechanism for us to connect to them, you know what, we'll find a way to connect to them, right? And there probably are loads of different stories around how they've done it. So I'm happy to take that offline and get some more information. But remember, the five that I told you about, and a SQL is in a database, right? There are loads, oh, sorry, not SQL. Um, ah, please never ever say that I said that. I mean, um, Excel is not a database, right? There are loads of other data storage facilities that you can use. So you are not limited to only those. Okay, so it's very important to know that. You have the freedom to do whatever you would like here. If you can't find a connector, as long as that solution or application or, or database or whatever has got an API, we can connect to it, which is pretty kick-ass. Okay, so last but not least, let's just recover once again, right? So all I did from a technical perspective with the pre-built Microsoft Digital Bricks, right, is you gave me data. I used the automation layer to put that into a database. I then showed you a model app with process around it. I showed you Power BI with some sexy, sexy little graphs and dashboards. And I showed you a Canvas app that I built in only a few minutes that will allow my field service technicians the ability to access that information. Um, if you'd like to get more information about this, I would say check out Microsoft Learn. Uh, they've got some pretty kick-ass stuff. I think they put a lot of effort into the Power Platform side of things. So I would definitely take some time to check it out and um, you know, focus a little bit on the data side of things. Uh, my theory is you know, you're gonna hear a lot of noise about apps. So everyone's like app crazy, you know, you'll hear how people have transformed their existence by building apps, good for them. Um, it's very much like as, as people that are more technical, keep, keep your eye on the prize with the data side of things. That's to me, that's where the real heavy lifting is and that's where the enterprise responses are. The apps for what you're doing, if you've already got your data, and you're happy to move into the interaction layer, you can do some serious, serious transformation with the, with Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, and, and Power Virtual Agents. But again, it's really be much better if you have your data structures and your data story set up correctly first. If not, you know, I always say from a citizen development movement, better a governed free market you know than a black market you don't know. At least let people have the opportunity to build out using the tools that you have. And uh, yeah, build up that citizen development moving using the interaction movement using the interaction layer. So as a wrap up, all I did today 
is number one, I explained to you some of the core fundamentals as to why the Power Platform exists from a low-code, no-code perspective, okay? That's where a lot of things are moving these days, but it does not mean as developers that, you know, it's hack the planet type stuff. It's not that. It actually gives you more opportunity because the more citizen developers there are, the more they need people like yourselves or people that are in the technical space to build out these digital bricks to help them, okay? Microsoft ain't going to do it all. The next thing that's really important, right, is that all I did was I spoke you through some of the more technical components as to why these exist. Remember, Microsoft's three core areas in their single Microsoft cloud are Azure, Modern Workplace, or M365, and business applications. And all that functionality is derived from there. And lastly, I showed you a very basic solution around a leak, right? Now, not the, not the vegetable, the actual thing in the street where water comes out. And um, I'd like to say, you know, that was pretty basic. You can do some pretty transformational stuff with these digital bricks. So I would say get cracking, get learning. And um, yeah, all the best. Thank you very much for having me, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Cool. Superb as always. The reference for understanding. <laughs> Thanks, man. I need a cup of tea. Excellent. Guys, if you have any questions for um, Chris, please come off mute or post it in the chat, then I can um then we can pick those up. Uh we have one question here, Chris. Uh, it says, from a project manager side, it is, is it, it is dangerous to create too many apps and go down a rabbit hole and lose sight of the prize, i.e. too much data? Or is this not such a thing? No, no, Sh Sharon's on the money. <laughs> so can I tell you what I do? Um, yeah, and, and that's a brilliant statement, by the way. So you get a thing called app sprawl, right? And um, it's so, it's so sad because like what happens is a lot of organizations don't actually do what we call ideation and strategy. So the example I'll give you is that um, the people that I'm working with at the moment, we sit down and we say, hey, we're like, what are, the, what are the key things? So we do actual ideation, actual advisory. And we're like, what are the real problems you need to solve? And then, you know, Jeff from accounts is like, hey, I need an app to do my timesheet. But actually it turns out that not only Jeff from accounts needs an app to do his timesheet, but everyone does, right? So that's a really great use case. But if it's a singular use case, um, it's much better to teach those people how to manage those solutions first and then set up the digital guide rails on our end and the IT side to make sure that those are managed. But Sharon's got a great point. The last thing you want to do is see like crazy ass app sprawl with no management. And um, I know I'm talking a lot, but I'm excited. So the other thing you can do <laughs> is set up a thing called the center of excellence. Now, Microsoft, and I'll chuck the link in the chat. Microsoft have got a center of excellence starter kit, right? It is technology. A center of excellence in the real world is people, process, and tech. So you can put as much tech into your organization as you want, but that's not going to solve your app, your app problem. Um, so one of the key thing is that uh, I really think it's important that you know that when you do the center of excellence, get the right people involved, okay? Get the technology involved. And for the love of the good Lord above, please build out processes that help you grow those apps up into something real, not just the thing that Jeff and accounts uses. Cool. Excellent. <laughs> Another question coming in. We've got quite a few actually, Chris. Um, so Tristan said, it's great to see the connectivity across the whole power suite. What are the licensing costs against other solutions or these other solutions? Yeah. Epic, epic questions. So, um, the way that I'm going to break it down for you guys is that there's actually three there's actually three mechanisms to license this right, and it's actually underneath each one of those cloud areas. Okay, so if you're using Microsoft 365, you have a Power Apps and Power Automate license using what I call personal productivity or team productivity connectors. So basically, anything that's like SharePoint or nothing that's going to be you know from a data perspective hugely enterprise, you can build out those apps under your M365 license. If you are under Azure, you can't use the M365 license. And if you have, so if you don't have Microsoft 365 and you don't have um, business applications, you can actually build out, did you know, Power Platform solutions using um, Power Apps and Power Automate, but only on things like G Suite. Because <laughs> that's because, like, if you're using the G Suite, you can still use, you still want to be able to build out kick ass solutions. And then under Dynamics, it's kind of like free reign, you've got access to most of the stack. If you guys want, I'll stick a link to a licensing talk that I did quite recently on here, and it breaks it down in a bit more detail. What I do want to say, and everyone says Power Platform licensing is complicated. It is not. It is actually very simple. Kind of like going to the shops. 
if you want to buy, if you want to drink two liters of milk for the day, you drink your two liters of milk and you go buy another one. It's the same as the licensing. It's like you use, you basically pay for what you consume. And that's pretty important. So please understand licensing is not the most difficult thing in the world. It's made difficult by the language. Okay. And my presentation will help you figure that out. Cool. Um, another question. How do you manage when the source database changes structure or adds new fields? Oh, awesome question. Yeah. So remember the app, the app has that connector. So like you've got your app, you've got your data structure and your connector. You literally just press the refresh button on that connector. And if you have new fields in that table, they show up in the list that you can add to the form. So it's, it's really kick ass, right? So like in Dataverse, I can go, um, I can go and add a field into uh, my contact table and then it'll be a visible. The moment I refresh that connector in the Power App and Automate, it's visible in there. So I can actually use it immediately. And that's the joy, right? Because remember the interaction layer respects the data layer. Cool. Um, and, and quite a broad question here. Um, it's thanks for the presentation first and foremost, but how do I get my senior team to really take data seriously and have them not freak out in a way when you talk to them about the simplicity of using the power platforms? Yeah, just fight them in the road. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, the way that I see it, right? So with, 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 with the senior folk, and I don't mean that in the, the frail folk, I mean that in the exec, right? Um, what I've found is that because of the way a lot of the time the platform has been pitched, uh, a lot of the time it comes across as anyone can build an app, which um, number one, I don't believe. I think that anyone can build a PowerPoint, but it can look horrendous, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll never get used. It's the same as an app. So you, I, I found it works in two ways. Number one, you have to have a proven use case, okay? Something that provides immediate business value. And I call that a targeted solution. And if you want to make people take data seriously, talk to them about how much they'll get fined for not obeying the rules. So look at GDPR as an example. You get fined 4% of your revenue base for disobeying GDPR rules. Hmm. Would you prefer to pay 10 bucks for a Power Apps license or 4% of your revenue? Uh, <laughs> it's kind of like, so you don't sell in the fear, but you've got to prove the facts. The other thing that I've found is that with, um, with IT execs and that kind of thing, they're always worried about governance and compliance. So you have to talk to them about digital guide rails. So business folk is like, hey, you can build apps, it's kick ass. And IT folk, you're gonna be like, listen, let's have a real talk. You can put up these governance compliance rules. We are implementing what we call a strategic platform, strategic, right? And that's key. It's not, when you buy a box of Lego, let me ask all of you, how many of you have only ever bought one box of Lego in your life? No one, no one ever buys one box of Lego. It's like me with my tattoos. I've got like 20, right? You always buy more because it's a platform. Okay, tattoos are not a platform. Lego is a platform. So you always buy more because you're like, hey, I can buy, I can put my fairy princess castle on top of my pirate ship and have a fairy princess pirate ship castle. This is kick ass. And that's how the power platform works. So that's selling the value. God, I've had a lot of sugar. <laughs> um, I think we'll ask just a few more guys and then I think we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll close the show. But we've got a question from um, someone here. What about processes which include financial transaction? Any guidelines on security? Oh, yeah, that's a big one, hey? So I'm going to try and answer this in the best way I can. It depends on the system that the app is built on top of, right? And I'm using apps as an example. So... The question I'd probably ask is that when you say financial transaction, I'm assuming you mean something that's like payment payment vibes. So you're not going to use a dataverse data structure and a canvas app as a mechanism to take payments. Okay. That's not PCR compliant. Dataverse at the moment, as far as I know, is not PCR compliant. Tools like Dynamics 365 Finance and Operations are PCR compliant. And therefore, you can take payments in there. So you do integrate to tools like WorldPay and things like that as the mechanism to run through those payments. From a financial transaction perspective, like actually storing line items. So, you know, Yoshi paid for a box of milk. Yeah, you can do that. No problem. You can store as much as you want in there. Because of Dataverse, and, and this is why I say with tools like Dataverse, you have multiple layers of security. So I can kind of uh, hide data down to the field level. And um, it also requires user roles and permissions. It's the same thing as like, would you put transactional data in SQL? Yeah, you would. So, or financial data, absolutely. I mean, it's, that's what's happening at the moment. Cool, excellent. Um, a question from Stevie Downer. What do you think are the main limitations within the PowerUp system? Are there any future developments you know which are exciting? 
Oh, Stevie, man, I want to hug you. So yeah, there are limitations. The first limitation is uh, B2C access. So you're not going to find this in your Apple and, and um, Android store. Okay, it's a B2B tool. It does have some B2B capabilities. So that's use case number one that I know. I don't want to say it falls down with the app piece, but it's done on purpose. There is an answer to that with a thing called Power Apps Portals, um, which I would definitely go and Bing or check Google or Ask Jeeves or whatever everyone else is doing. But um, that's the answer to the B2C thing, but it's not WYSIWYG like the Canvas app editor. The other limitation that I find is that with the app piece, in particular Canvas apps, right? People try and build Canvas apps into line of business solutions. They're not meant for that, okay? That's a model-driven apps are for. So the limitation is down to like, where's the line? And a lot of the time it's gray. So Unfortunately, there's a lot of trial and error there. And I don't think anyone said a hard and fast, don't do this with a Canvas app, except for like, you know, don't build out 5,000 screens and try and, you know, build relational collections in it. That's a dumb idea. Um, the future developments, mixed reality, okay? It's absolutely epic. I've seen some really cool um, demos. So there's a guy called Daniel Christian. He's a, he's a Microsoft MVP. He does some really kick-ass stuff on um, how mixed reality works in the apps. I'm also seeing a lot more artificial intelligence being built in directly. So very much like PowerPoint where it's naturally there. That's something that's happening at the moment. And I think, I personally think that smart apps are going to be like the absolute future, the app, see what the absolute future. But yeah, MR and AI are the two things and not this crummy like, hey, let's write 5,000 lines of code to teach a computer to fight us. It's more like intelligent things that you would naturally do manually. Cool. Um, yeah. Excellent. I think we'll have just, I think one or two more guys. I think we'll, we'll end it at uh, Brittany's. Um, but one from Sharon. Um, how much has GDPR influenced the storage of data? Oh, uh, I don't think it's influenced. I think, I think it's had, okay. I think it's had an influence. I think it's more, how has GDPR influenced the way we perceive the storage of data, not the way Microsoft does it. I think that Microsoft naturally did this already. Okay. They put up the compliance center to make it a lot easier for us. But I think people that were purely, that used to stick their, um, their data into unreliable data storage facilities and not actually look after it and not care about it, I think they do care now. And I think that it's influenced the, the, the security and the auditability of data structures that we have, as well as things like DR and all of that. So I do think it has had an influence, but I think Microsoft was ahead of the curve a long time ago with that already. So yeah, that's a great question, but I think it's more our perception that it's influenced rather than the technology. Cool. And can you write back to the source databases with Power Apps? Yeah, spot on. You can. Yeah. So the whole idea is is that um you can do you can do app to data structure directly. So I can have a SQL database and I can write direct from app to SQL. You have to decide if you want to do that. Okay. So there's ways and protocols and means to doing that um, as and when, right? But yeah, it's totally doable. But if you have the right user roles and permissions set up. So remember, everything I say in any demo is always caveated with right user roles, right permissions, right security. So that's my little umbrella of safety. Excellent. Um, and one last question from Britt is, can you clarify what apps, from example, would be accessible to external partners? For example, if developing the app, is this limited to internal MS system members? In other words, what could you export and share? Oh, awesome question. Okay, so this is a two-prong approach. First of all, Power Apps, right, is Microsoft-based. So when you leverage a Power App, you need to be an Active Directory user in some, some way, shape, or form. Okay, so that's the first thing. And I'm talking about Canvas Apps and Model Driven. So what I can do is say, for example, Britt, if you have a um, Microsoft 365 tenants on your end, and I have a Microsoft tenant 365, uh, 365 tenants on my end, I can share an app with you and you can access that app as long as you've got access to the data storage, right? The app is not the problem here. It's the data storage, which is the thing. So what I would say is that I find that when I build an app or a solution, I build the solution, I pick it up in my nice little solution suitcase and I go to my customer's tenants and I drop it in there. And that solution contains automations, apps, data structures, everything that I need. And um, yeah, they will have the ability to manage their own security and compliance. So that's the one thing. And the other thing is that the export and share is actually really important because 
in a lot of organizations, I worked with a company the other day that had 17 Office 365 tenants. And not all of them want to be guests in each other's tenants. So you can actually physically lift the app and plonk it over somewhere else. And in fact, the website that I, that, um, I run from a community perspective called TDG, we have a thing called the Power Apps Bank, where you can actually go on and download Power Apps and like import them into your environments and play with them. 